What are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings which I adopted in the review. They worked for my unit according to my preferences and according to my colorimetric targets. Everyone will have their own preferences and individual units differ. So the first thing to consider is what preset you're going to use. There are two sets of presets on this monitor. Some of them are found in gaming, they're called game modes. There's also a list in professional, they're called pro modes. Just be aware that you can select user from either list, but it's exactly the same thing. Also be aware that if you select something in pro mode, so I've just selected sRGB, then I look at my game modes, it looks like I've got users selected, but I don't. It's the last thing you selected. And it does actually say at the top, in the little pink lettering there, pro mode sRGB, so you know which preset is actually active. So I would recommend user because it gives you the full flexibility and actually the default state of that setting is pretty good. I'm just going to quickly mention the rest. So premium color, that oversaturates things. It pulls shades closer to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So it crushes shade variety, you lose shade variety, and it gives a very artificial and weird look to things. FPS does some of that and it also selectively mutes some colors. So you can see that the nice green grass there has disappeared, but some of the yellowish greens remain. So that could give you a competitive edge, perhaps, in certain games. So if you like that kind of thing, then feel free to use it in certain scenarios. Next is racing, and that's another just heavily oversaturated one. Looks a bit like premium colour, really. There's also a sharpness filter applied. That actually applies to FPS as well, I should have mentioned. There's RTS, which is a bit more toned down. It doesn't have the same kind of sharpness filter. Looks like the gamma might be boosted a little bit, but if you like how this looks, again, feel free to use it. RPG, which looks more neutral and actually more like user. And the pro modes now, eco is the default setting. This basically just has more limited brightness, so it will reduce your power consumption, hence the eco. But you can customize various things in eco if you want to use that. There's anti-blue, that's a low blue light setting, which is explored in the review. It is effective, although it gives a bit of a green tint. You can also select that low blue light setting on other presets and have that set to on, as it is now by default with the anti-blue setting. And that will give you similar results in terms of the blue light filter effect. There's movie, which is another one of the oversaturated looking presets, heavily oversaturated. Office, which is kind of similar to user, sets it to a brightness of 55 by default, so sort of a, a moderate level. And there are then three color space emulation modes. So there's sRGB, which emulates the sRGB color space in terms of the gamut, it clamps the gamut, and that's explored in the review. That's certainly gonna be a best setting for some people. If you like standard content to look as it should under SDR, then sRGB will achieve that in many cases. If you want to emulate the Adobe RGB color space, then that's what the Adobe RGB setting can do. And then there's Display P3, which will emulate the DCI P3 color gamut. Again, these are all explored in the review. So these emulation settings, they do restrict the other settings you can adjust. So for example, you can't apply the low blue light filter, and that's because you can't change the color temperature, you can't adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. You can adjust the brightness, you can't adjust the contrast. So my preference, and again, it doesn't matter whether you select this in the gaming or professional menu, aside from the color space emulation settings, which certainly do have their place, is to use user, and that will use the full native gamut of the monitor, so the, so the full wide gamut, and it gives you full control over the settings. So aside from sticking to the user setting, if you want to use VRR, then make sure Adaptive Sync is set to on. That will allow you to use technologies such as NVIDIA G-Sync Compatible and AMD FreeSync. The other thing I changed is brightness. I set that to 52, which achieved close to my usual 160 nit target, which I go for in my reviews. It suits my lighting environment and it's just done for consistency. It's something I've always done in my reviews, but you will have your own lighting environment and preferences. So please adjust this accordingly. And the other thing I changed is I set the color temperature to customization and I set red, green, and blue color channels to 199 and 99. On my unit, at least with the original firmware that it shipped with before I updated it, it seemed to have all of these channels set to 50 by default when you went into customize, but that really limited brightness and it just gave everything a dull look. Basically, it wasn't looking like it should at all. With these all set to 100, that's actually the correct neutral position. So I'm not sure why it would be set to 50 by default, but make sure these are set to 100 unless for some reason that looks clearly wrong on your unit. It should really look more like the normal setting does when you've got everything set to 100, and then you can adjust from there. So that's really what I did. I'm running my system at 240 hertz, adaptive sync set to on using the user preset, 
reduced the brightness to 52 and I made a few tweaks to the color channels. I'm now going to activate HDR and just quickly talk about the HDR settings of the monitor. There's not as much to consider here. I'm now in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I'm running the game under HDR just so I can show you the HDR settings in an environment which is actually HDR, unlike the Windows desktop. The thing to be aware of here is that there is an effect with the preset under HDR. I don't know why they've done it like this. Maybe this will change in future firmware, but quite a few of these, they do make some undesirable changes. So there's a sharpness filter again, like I mentioned with SDR, and that does apply under HDR as well. If you've got some of these selected like FPS or racing, there's also some strange oversaturation, which I mentioned earlier, and that also seems to apply under HDR. Just really most of these upset the image and gives a look which strays far from the accurate and intended look under HDR. So unless you're loving how things look with one of these other settings, I would recommend user. That is really how things are supposed to look. The same with the professional settings. So for example, if you had a gamut clamp enabled, then that will actually affect the color gamut under HDR. And unlike under SDR, you shouldn't be restricting things to sRGB or for that matter, one of the other color spaces. You should be letting the monitor use its full native gamut and then things will be appropriately mapped under HDR. You're not supposed to be restricting the gamut using a gamut clamp. So I'm not sure why they let you do this. Just remember to switch over to user and if you're not using user under SDR, then you do have to remember to do that when you switch to HDR. So there's not really much else you need to concern yourself with because you can't change things like the color temperature or the brightness under HDR. You can adjust the sharpness if you really want to, but zero neutral sharpness is good. This has a nice pixel density and really things look as they should with the sharpness set to zero. If you happen to be running in a non-native resolution, as I mentioned in the review, you might want to use this sharpness filter whether you're in SDR or HDR, it's up to you. Display HDR, which is in image, this is an important setting. So you can have that set to peak 1000 nits for the full brightness capability. Or if you want a more consistent but lower brightness, or generally lower brightness, which won't peak as high, then you can set that to true black 400. I think it's worth going through the MSI OLED care settings because these are certainly something you will have to consider. If you scroll down to OLED panel info or scroll up as I did just then, then it will say at the top panel protect it says 27. That means it's run its little panel protect cycle 27 times my unit has. And it says one hour, 30 minutes. That's how long since it has last run the cycle. So this cycle is really the most important OLED care feature. And this is the message which will come up on the screen. Initially, it will do this every four hours, this message. As you can see there, there is an option to extend the message to 16 hours, but that doesn't change how often it wants to run the cycle. So how this works is when the monitor goes into standby or you turn it off with the power button, if it's due to run this cycle, so you've been using it for a cumulative four hours or more since it last run the cycle, then it will want to run the cycle and it will just do this itself. The power LED will blink amber so you know it's doing this and it takes, as it says in the message, several minutes to complete. So it doesn't matter whether you've got the message coming up every four hours or whether you've got it, which is the auto setting, by the way, or whether you've got it set to 16 hours, it'll try and run its cycle every four hours. But the message itself, it's in the middle of the screen. I find it quite obtrusive if I'm actually using the monitor. So I would set this to 16 hours just for the message. I don't really care for the message. It'll just do its thing anyway without the message. So back to the menu now, it, this just gives you a little summary of what you've set everything to. So I've got pixel shift set to normal and everything else is deactivated. Now I'm not saying this is gonna be optimal for everyone. The reason I've done this is because I don't like these other things interfering with the review, potentially causing little distractions or upsetting readings, that kind of thing. But just to quickly go through this, so pixel shift, you can set that to normal, fast or slow, depending on your preferences. There's an active area, an over-provisioning of pixels around the image between the panel border and the actual image. And the screen will just occasionally shift sort of down, up, left or right in this border. So the pixels can be slightly displaced and you can have that behavior set to slow where it won't do it very often, normal where it will do it a bit more or fast where it will do it even more frequently. If you want to manually run the panel protect cycle, perhaps you've got a little bit of temporary image retention you want to try and get rid of, then you can do that. The protect notice is really what I was talking about just before, have it set to auto and it'll come up every four hours or 16 hours or usage 16 hours and it'll come up after 16 hours of cumulative usage. 
Static screen detection. This actually is quite a useful feature. And to be honest, I probably would use this even as a review. I don't think it's particularly obtrusive because it tends to work well. What this does is it dims the screen if it hasn't been used. It will ignore little things like a cursor blinking or the clock changing on the desktop. And it will still do its thing and dim if you're not using it, even if the clock's changing or the cursor's blinking. So it can be a useful feature, but I personally just like to use Windows Power Management to turn the screen off after three minutes or so. That also allows it to run its Panel Protect feature if it needs to. You can set starting in, so that's the time before the screen will begin to dim, I believe. I'm going to be honest, I haven't really played around a lot with this feature or actually some of the other OLED care features. Time required, so I'm not sure how that differs between the starting in, but you can set that as well. Reducing level. So this is how much you actually want the screen to dim by. So a larger number will give a greater dimming effect. And as it says, reducing effect does depend on the brightness you set it to, and also the display HDR setting, which will naturally change the brightness levels of the display. And next you've got multi-logo detection. So that will dim logos or just little static elements on the screen after a given amount of time. You can control the reducing effect or reducing level, set that between one, which is the weakest, Sorry, set that to one, which is the weakest, or two, which is a bit stronger. There's only two settings. Now, I find that this kind of setting, again, I haven't really explored it extensively on this model, but I have used it on other models in the past. I find it sometimes starts dimming things I don't want it to, like HUD elements in games, and also potentially things like address bars or little icons in web browsers, which I don't really want it to dim. But do have a play with all of these features and really just disable them one by one. Try and use as many of them as you can bear. That's what I'd say. Taskbar detection, similar kind of thing, but with the taskbar. I found with this, I did actually play with this a little bit. It gave a kind of shadowy look if I have my dark taskbar, like I like to use against a lighter web page. And I didn't much like that, to be honest. And this one has three different reducing levels, with three being the strongest effect. Boundary detection, the same thing, but it won't just apply to the taskbar. It will apply more broadly. So you can see that between windows. And even if you've got, let's say, a white page with a dark image next to it, the boundary between those two, there could be some dimming there. If you don't mind this effect, again, please do feel free to use it. I don't personally like the effect. And this one, again, has three different levels. So just start with level one and just try and increase it. See what you can cope with, if anything. So yeah, really the TLDW for this particular part of the video is use as many of these as you can cope with. At the bare minimum, you're going to be using pixel shift because you can't disable that and panel protect definitely let it run its panel protect cycle when it wants to. If it starts to run the cycle and you need to use the monitor, you can. You can just press the power button and it will stop doing the cycle. It's not really something you have to religiously make sure it's done every four hours, just that if you're naturally not using the monitor, just let it, and it wants to run the cycle, just let it do that. Just to show you another feature of the monitor, which may be of interest and may be considered a best setting depending on the kind of games you play, and that is the smart crosshair. No, it's not, you little cheater. And that is the night vision setting. So this is a gamma enhancement setting, which lifts up dark shades so that they're more visible. It's really to give you a competitive edge, make enemies more easy to see against the background or in dark areas, that kind of thing. So normal has quite a moderate effect. Strong is stronger, strongest stronger again. And AI seems to be at least on Legom here, legom.nl, the black levels test, it appears that AI is somewhere between strong and strongest, but again, it depends on what's being displayed. It's fairly selective in that it doesn't lift your black up, so you shouldn't lose contrast using this setting, but it certainly does lift up a lot of medium bright shades, so it will upset the image, and so it won't just lift up darker areas, but also somewhat brighter areas can be lifted up as well. But at least it doesn't raise the black up, because that really would destroy the <laughs> OLED experience completely. There's also AI vision. As it says, enabling it will affect night vision, because it does its own thing. And I will admit that I don't know exactly how this differs from setting night vision to AI. It might be exactly the same thing. I haven't really played with this extensively. Perhaps it looks at the image in a more intelligent or more thorough way. I've got no idea. I know on some MSI monitors, LCDs, it includes a dynamic contrast element, but being an OLED, that doesn't apply in this case. So it's not entirely clear what it does. 
But anyway, the point is that night vision or AI vision, you might want to use these settings for a competitive edge if you play that kind of game and you like that kind of thing.